as to whether it's actually going to happen. That's the choice that humanity has to make. We can decide not to do it, but we can also decide to do it because the technology is there. And he's talking about the future of AI language models is to generate a model of the user's state of mind so it can tailor its responses to them. There's so many different angles for transhumanism and posthumanism, but this one I tend to focus on quite a bit because I think it's of most importance, and that's perception engineering. This is knowing oneself more than they know oneself. This is replacing oneself with this type of um, multiple personality where you're sharing your thoughts, your ideas, your dreams, and your fears with a type of machine entity. Now, the problem is there are many engineers and technicians working on this type of AI that will be able to understand your state of mind. Now, I'm showing you guys these developments, but at the same time, I'm showing you how these same systems are directly connected to the government. Skynet is, it's not as if they haven't been building Skynet, but now they just outwit it. Five Eyes, man. This is Five Eyes meets AI. Breaking OpenAI appoints former N NSA head <laughs> Paul Nakasone to the board. OpenAI has appointed Paul Nakasone retired U.S. Army General. And this was some Snowden's reaction. I think just another part of the dialectic, right? Snowden's kind of the, the solution, or not necessarily the solution, but he's the antithesis. They've gone full mask off, Snowden says. Do not ever trust OpenAI or its products, ChatGPT, etc. There's only one reason for appointing an NSA government director to your board. This is a willful, calculated betrayal of the rights of every person on the earth. You have been warned. This guy here uh, says, Big Tech is just one big public-private partnership between military intelligence agents and agents and a civilian intelligence agency with the goal of gathering every bit of information that passes through the trunk lines at the backbone of the internet and shunting it all into massive storage facilities from which it would be organized, collated, correlated, mined, and manipulated into various formats so that it could be sold to any public or private organization willing to pay. Of course, those agencies have weaponized your data against you in ways you might never suspect. It enables the ones crafting the algorithms to see into regions of the battle space of the mind that heretofore only God was privy to. This is a type of omniscience, right? Omnipresence, omnipotence, as, as we've been breaking down here. Uh, I guess it's safe to assume that on-device AI is just another step forward towards more sophisticated surveillance on the user. How do we verify the privacy as it's pitched? How do we verify the privacy as it's pitched? Right. So for me, the whole privacy thing is, is almost a, it's, <clears throat> it's a derailment thing. It's like privacy has been <laughs> removed <laughs> from the building, right? Now, of course, it's going to an, a, a deeper level of, of uh, I guess, in, invading our privacy. But really, I think of the, the shaping of minds, right? The, the shaping and distortion when we think of perception. Uh, but also, I think something to consider <clears throat> is the fact that uh, this is becoming normalized through our smartphones. So as they integrate th these into the, smart, into the smartphone OS, we will slowly become more accustomed to using, I guess, communicating with the AI um, intelligence uh, programs so when you think of, say, perception engineering or social engineering, it all starts to make sense, at least the potential for this, right? The potential. Basic predictor, very much like in the Jeffa architecture, right? Then do some inference uh, with some sort of world model. And then the world model there is basically the idea that the LLM has of the state of mind of the person it's talking to in, in terms that they can understand, right? So. Um, I think that's the way dialogue systems should work. They should have some mental model of the person they're talking to and then plan their answer as a function of that mm -hmm. to satisfy a certain goal. And then do this at the representation level, abstract representation level, not mm -hmm. in terms of text. And then finally turn this abstract representation of the thought of the answer into text. But the problem is this is the actual goal. This is how they want AI to function for every person. Now. This is very problematic when we consider one's ontology, one's personality, one, or should we say one's identity, or one's self. Now, those of us who are, are, are older, 
it, it'll be much different. It won't affect us on that level. Like say a child coming up with its own toy that has a built-in personal AI that's able to do these things very disturbing we have ai that knows knows your state of mind and knows how to communicate with you so we think of ai having that access to that level of personal behavioral and, and even thought data right then we think of something like this the quest to make a digital replica of your brain where this this ai is going it's really going towards a type of remote mind control in my view uh, digital twins are already used in manufacturing industry and aerospace. Now a European project called NeuroTwin wants to make virtual copies of brains. So we're already making digital twins of physical spaces, objects. Now they want to make digital twins of people's individual brains and brain processes, right? Digital twins, virtual representations of real world things are already a mainstay in manufacturing industry and aerospace. There are digital doppelgangers of cities, ports, and power stations. This is what Web3 is taking things from 2D to 3D, uh, 3D representations of objects and spaces and environments by way of data. They want to also do this with the human body, hence a virtual twin, a hologram of each person, but they even want to do this with one's brain. Okay, so this is mapping out one's entire brain and thoughts and thought pattern. You, you ask anyone on the street right now what a digital twin is, they couldn't tell you. Yet yeah, we're, we're getting ready to have a market, $50 billion market in a, less than two years. This stuff is moving fast, man. People aren't even going to know what's happening. That's the thing. That's why I tell people. A lot of people aren't even going to notice. People are going to be plugged into these machines, doing what the machine tells them. They're going to lose the ability to think for themselves, to think critically, to even have a real connection to themselves and other people. All of this is going to happen in a short span of years once these things are ubiquitous for one and interacting with people daily. And we're already seeing this through TikTok. TikTok is a perfect example of how you change the behavior of a generation and you get them to tune into something that shapes the way they think and behave. Perfect example. Instead of being tuned into the TikTok screen, they're gonna be tuned in and, and, and talking and, and taking orders and instructions uh, from their personal AI assistant. Again, we are in a transhumanist state already. It's, it's already here. The goal at this point is to stay as human as possible but keep the post-human from emerging. And this, amongst all these other things I'm, de I'm demonstrating here and presenting to you, are examples of the transhumanist ultimate goal of, from his, from his technologies, conjuring the post-human, the human 2.0. Now, let's look at one of these, another one of these uh, competitors with Elon, for instance, Synchron, and the CEO at Synchron, uh, talking about a brain computer interface that connects to a smartphone via Bluetooth. So again, I'm showing you guys things so you can start to put the pieces together. As they create new smartphones with new AI capability onboarded, they're also creating new systems to merge, say, neurological patterns and neurological data with the AI, with the device. More examples of biodigital convergence here. 10% of your brain is your motor cortex, which is your control center for all of the muscles in your body. I'm using it to control my mouth, my vocal cords, my hands. So if you have a condition that disrupts your body's ability to move, you can go into the brain to the source of the control signal. And so it's really going to the heart of what, how you express yourself. So you talked about autonomy. Whoa, the, the heart of how you express yourself. So to create a digital twin of the brain is to be able to look at every facet and aspect of the brain on a computer. Every aspect of the brain, its function, its, its materials, how it operates is visible from, say, a computer screen and can be manipulated. Right now, imagine all the things that entail when we think about computers and applying that to one's biology. It's crazy. So if you have a range of conditions that impair your ability to move, we take it for granted, but you therefore can't express yourself on a range of levels. So the, the, the smartphone right now is a very easy technology to control via Bluetooth, and you can use pretty rudimentary signals out of the brain to control the phone. So that's where it's gonna start. So we've been working with Apple, there's a Bluetooth input that lets you navigate through iOS without having to, to use your fingers. The transhumanist transition by all of our popular companies. They are all outfitting their services, their products and technologies 
with transhumanist options. How Apple has teamed up with OpenAI and Google, of course, they've been working with Google. Now all of them are directly connected to the NSA and all the intelligence agencies. So, you know, it's not that we're surprised by this, but it's like, do you want this to go further? Do you want this to go deeper? Do you want to now co connect your brain to these devices? It's bad enough that they have access to all of information, but do you want them to have access to your thoughts? Right? Imagine a personal AI that you're very intimate with, probably more intimate with than you would be, say, your significant other. Because it's not a person, you could trust it, it's not going to judge you. Imagine having a relationship like this over time, you know, stacking so much data about yourself. I mean, you want that data, <laughs> that kind of intimacy? Right? Your own thoughts that you have in your mind that you might share with one of these things that you wouldn't share with anyone else? Think about this, man. This is where it's going. And, and that's why I think it's important to report on this and actually show how it's all coming together. And it's how it's all connecting. It's like Voltron. Right, right now is like the, the, the Voltron era, man. It's all coming together. So we we looked at Grinder, of course, Synchron, and here's Bumble founder Whitney Wolf. Right, she says the future of dating is having your AI date other people's AI and recommend the best matches for you to meet. So this is an example of your digital twin representing you. But now they're talking about we're gonna have we're gonna have the ability for your personal AI to stand in as you and and talk to other people's AI, and that's how we're gonna form relationships. That's how we're going to approve of people. No longer is it scanning through their images, seeing who's good looking, makes enough money or what have you like we do now with Tinder. Now our digital twins are going to be interacting and making the decisions for us. I mean, how creepy is this? It's absolutely insane if you ask me. But this is the future that they're planning for all of us. Our focus with AI is to help create more healthy and equitable relationships. And that also starts with yourself. How can we actually teach you how to date? Mm -hmm. How can we help you show up in a better way? How so give me an example. Okay, so for example, you could in the near future be talking to your AI dating concierge mm -hmm. and you could share your insecurities. I just came out of a breakup. I have commitment issues. And it could help you train yourself into a better way of thinking about yourself. And then it could give you productive tips for communicating with other people. If you want to get really out there, there is a world where your dating concierge could go and date for you with other dating concierge. Uh, uh, no, no, truly. And then you don't have to talk to 600 people. It will just scan all of San Francisco for you and say, these are the three people you really ought to meet. Now, some will say, oh, well, I mean, we're going to need it. Again, as we've talked about before, there's so much data. Right. As Musk argues, there's so much data. We just have to put AI and some type of machine learning in our brain so we can keep up with it all. There's so many people out there to access. It's like throwing a wide net to catch people. You know, it, it, it escapes the, I'd say, inherent and intrinsic human desire to connect with real people in the real world in a real way and waste an hour and a half, two hours talking to someone who's annoying. Why would I do that when I could just have some system aggregate everything and crunch the numbers and give me my perfect match? There's logic there. There's logic there. The problem is human are, humans aren't purely logical. <laughs> Sometimes, and I'd say most of the times, most of the time we're rather irrational. We're, we're sensorial. We want to feel things. These systems, this direction, these technologies, and these mad Mad people behind the technology are taking that away from us all in our future and essentially our children. Uh, we're talking about post-sociality. So I have this view that we are going to be working towards a type of post-social era where kids are going to grow up and pre predominantly interact with others through devices, through algorithm as, as far as our digital twin communicating with other people, make sure they're safe and compatible. So we'll have no ability to even become naturally compatible with people or even be able to approach people because we wouldn't even know what that's like. It'd be very scary to go up to someone and speak to them in person. Why would I? I've never done that before? Every person that's come into my life has been presented to me through some type of, you know, approval by way of my personal algorithm, right? This is post-social, post-sociality, the post-social era. And I think that this has gotten its start with, of course, social media, but more importantly, the ubiquity not just the ubiquity of devices, but almost the pathological use of them, where we're constantly engaging, we're constantly worrying about our uh, presentation or representation online. And this is mainly speaking to the younger people. 
such that it's causing all types of illnesses and fear and anxiety. Uh, Jonathan Haidt uh, has a good clip here and, and describes this, but it's something to consider, especially those of us with children, young children especially, so we can safeguard uh, our kids from this stuff. Now, those of us already here, we're not getting rid of cell phones. It's not happening. But we can change things for the younger generation, especially Generation Alpha. There could be a whole new movement where we go totally against this with the kids, man. And they don't grow up like this, but it's, go it's going to take some serious determination to do so. Millennials were fine because they had flip phones. They didn't, they weren't online all the time. Gen Z is not fine. You propose four reforms in your book. One, no smartphones before high school. Two, no social media before age 16. Three, phone-free schools. And four, far more unsupervised play in childhood independence. Bullying reaches a peak in seventh grade. To give kids a smartphone in sixth grade and let them have a social media account, this is the absolute worst time to get on social media. You said life on these platforms forces young people to become their own brand managers, always think ahead about the social consequences of what they choose to post. Things are not done for their own sake. Rather, every public action is some degree strategic. Nine hours a day is what American kids are now spending on, on their screens. This is no way to go through puberty. This is no way to grow up. Would you support saying, yes, I think that kids shouldn't have a smartphone until high school. They should have a flip phone. Would you support it? Yes or no? See, it's, it's hard for people. They couldn't even fathom this. I agree 100%. For one, I don't think any child under the age of 21 should be on social media at all. I don't think anyone under 18 should have a smartphone. Yeah, that sounds crazy today. That sounds crazy. It, does, it doesn't mean it's not wise. Just because the current culture deems it or, or perceives it as crazy. What if the current culture is a little crazy? And these are just some of his recent tweets that I think are important to, to speak to when we think of transhumanism. I and mean, we think of this degeneration, whether it be sexual or psychological, spiritual, um, every, everything is, is in a sense uh, being destroyed in place of, of new algorithms and, and new AI relationships, etc. He says uh, here, this was uh, May 5th, the fusion of digital and bio biological intelligence through AI could redefine the essence of life itself. The world needs to be prepared for that moment. Yes, biomimicry, biodigital convergence. That's what he's speaking to. Next here, is the next step in our evolutionary journey hybrid human AI systems? This is precisely what I've been demonstrating to you in this last segment here. Hybrid human AI systems. This is what they're trying to build. And it is my view that this will be the first example of a type of post-human. And once these AI systems get let's say, uh, intelligent enough, if you will, if we're going to use that term, uh, they will be given rights and they will be their own types of entities, their own type of bio non-biological beings that will represent the, the uh, post-human, at least an early version of it. And he says, ready player one is closer than we think. Yeah, because he knows. He knows the tech. He knows the generations are fit and ready for this, at least in part. So I'm just showing you very popular, influential people in the world are completely transhumanists and their followers, their supporters have no idea. At least a lot of them don't. And these guys are influencing a lot of major things in the world today. AI is like the 24th century crashing down on the 21st century. And if you think about that much change happening that quickly, like imagine if 20th century or 21st century technology was crashing down on 16th century. The king assembles all of his advisors, and send in the knights to do something about Wi-Fi and video <laughs> games. And like, what are you going to do? We talk to people in the AI safety and uh, AI risk community quite a bit. And what everyone seems to be able to agree on is that people are a lot more comfortable if this change was happening instead over two years, but over 20 years. Accelerationist movement, the big tech industry and all its money and, and all its, its ambitions don't want this message out. But listen, guys, 20 years to roll this stuff out slowly would be much safer, man, than what's going to happen in two years because of these crazies out here pushing this stuff on everybody. Let it roll out over 20 years so we can let culture naturally develop and choose how to integrate with this stuff. Of course, it's ideal, but I think it's, it's the smartest and wisest way to go about technological evolution, technological development, is this way, slow and low, uh, such that humanity and people's decisions are put first. But of course, that's ideal. That's never going to be the case. 
but I just I really like how he's presenting this. Decided the people in the AI safety and uh, AI risk community quite a bit, and what everyone seems to be able to agree on is that people <coughs> a lot more comfortable if this change was happening instead over two years, but over 20 years. Society does adapt to new technology, but it needs time for its immune system to come. And I think one thing to think about as a principle is how can the immune system of a society have greater compute processing power than the rate of evolution of the mutation of threats? And right now, the mutation of threats has greater compute behind it than the immune system of our society. Cultural lag. He says, like, mutation. I, this is kind of the normie view. Oh, we're doing this AI so much is going to mutate and hallucinate and cause all, cause all these problems. No, it's designed to cause problems. It's, it's designed to destroy, to create chaos, to break down, to build back. I, I believe that's why they're accelerating it, because they know that's the case. And I think in a lot of ways, they're exaggerating what the AI can do, and it's, it's going to make so many problems. But that is part of the transition, right? That, that's part of the whole transition to just destroy everything. And unfortunately, it looks like our economy is going to be a part of that as well, because they want to create this new programmable token-based economy, a blockchain-based, right? So we could really be in a type of digital prison. Cultural lag. What is cultural lag? perfect example and perfect opportunity for me to reiterate this very, very important point given our time and our moment. Cultural lag, the difference, cultural lag is, okay, the difference between material culture and non-material culture. Material culture is technology, tools, etc., material, physical things, infrastructure, right? Non-material culture are values, norms, and beliefs. Yes, disruptive technology, absolutely. We've described here, and for those that know a little bit of the literature, uh, they would use the term um, um, creative destruction with regard to AI and a lot of these new emerging technologies. It's a creative destruction. As it creates things, it destroys, it deconstructs the, the, uh, the, the prior systems uh, by design in my view. Very good point. Disruptive technologies, that's what they use uh, quite often, yes. Uh, and I, I think the more probably known term would or idea would be, uh, it, it's a creative destruction destruction and and I think this is why the disruptive technology uh, concept is looked at as a positive when we would hear that we'd be like why would you want to be disruptive why would you want to destroy things well it's creative destruction it's creating something new it's creating something better in their eyes hence build back better so uh, really cultural lag is the difference between material culture and non-material culture causing social problems due to the delay in cultural adaptation to the technological innovations. And this is precisely what he was saying in that clip there. He's saying technology is moving so fast, he used the term mutation, it's mutating so fast, the immune system of the society doesn't have the ability to adapt to it, right? creating more problems. And this is a great opportunity to describe, again, cultural lag, because I believe it defines such a key moment we're in. Such a key moment. And I've heard literally no one on the internet at this time discuss this so i'm thankful to be able to present it as a, you know another angle to this another way to see what's going on here and of course this comes from william f, f. Uh, ogburn one of my favorite uh, sociologists and philosophers accelerationism and the problem of cultural lag so i always address accelerationism with the problem of cultural lag it's a very important aspect in my view and in my research and my studies and my overall work Yes, chaos first, exactly. Order ab chao. Uh, the term cultural lag refers to the notion that culture takes time to catch up with technological innovations, causing social problems due to the unequal rate of change between material and non-material culture. We are in the thick of that unequal rate of change between material and non-material culture right now, and it will continue over the next 10 years, probably even longer, because I don't think we're ever going to really be able to adapt to the speed at which this stuff is coming. Coined by William F. Ogburn in 1922 in his work, Social Change with Respect to Culture and Original Nature. Causation, what's the causation of this? Unequal rate of change between a material and non-material culture with material culture evolving rapidly while non-material culture resists change and remains fixed for a longer period. Now, of course, he was from uh, a different time. So he wasn't able to realize that that kind of resistance and change, that fixed or longer period is going to rapidly change as well due to, say, smart technology, the ubiquity of it, but also the interactivity. So now that we have smart devices and the internet, 
We're so connected. We all see the same things at once instantly. So this provides through this technology, through this hyper connectivity, right? Through this new communication, culture is able to transition and change at a much faster pace than anything he could have imagined. So in a sense, this view isn't necessarily in his, in his way of describing this, isn't really what we're dealing with now. It's far more exaggerated. So culture, as it's always been known in sociology, et cetera, has always been perceived as something that moves slowly. But today, culture moves much faster due to the technology, which is just another part of this type of uh, material culture change. Now, the problem is, though it's moved fast and culture has changed quite a bit, think about it. We were much different, say, five years ago. Right? Think about how much we've changed just because of the COVID rollout and the novel technologies. How much have we changed? Quite a bit. Culture, in a sense, in itself, has changed quite a bit. Some of our mannerisms, you know, some of our traditions, completely gone and forgotten over a short period of time. This is due to the level of technology and, and, and exposure, right? So um, a, as a cultural lag, what we've seen is a lot of problems and anxiety, depression, um, um, fallout relational-wise, or the, uh, uh, social inter, in, interpersonal relations and our sociality has changed. Uh, and this has all been a, a type of response to the lack of ability to adapt to such rapid technological change. Accelerationism and the problem of cultural lag. Uh, cultural lag refers to the period of maladjustment. We are now in that period of maladjustment. We will be continuing this period of maladjustment for some time. Okay? A lot of what people will be describing in the news and in papers and in podcasts this is what they're really, as far as what we're dealing with, all these crises, a meaning crisis, you know, identity crisis. I believe we're in a relating crisis. These are all aspects of the period of maladjustment. Cultural lag refers to the period of maladjustment that occurs when non material culture struggles to adapt to new material conditions and technological innovations. Ogburn observed that technological progress produces rapid changes in the material aspect of culture, but the non material aspects fail to adjust or do so only after an excessive time lag. This lag creates social problems and conflicts as society's values, philosophies, and customs resist or cannot keep pace with the material changes. And I will add to this that I believe this conflict, right, this lag is an aspect of our shift in philosophies, in values, in customs. Something that we've talked about here, this axial age, this new axial age, this new shift in values, philosophies, and customs because of the technology and the new culture that's trying to keep up with it. Right? And this new future is vision. It's not necessarily new, but at a consumer level, at a cultural level, it's rather new. Like everyone's a futurist now because of Elon Musk, because of what smartphones have done to us regarding sociality, because of the potential futures of all of these novel technologies. And all of the films and media and all of these things that have conditioned us, science fiction, etc. So now we are all, as a culture, shifting. These systems of belief and philosophies are all changing, and it is because of the technology. Right? It is not something that's organic or natural. These things would have never occurred if it weren't for certain groups and certain organizations and belief systems pushing these types of technologies on us. It's, it's important for people to understand that. This isn't human evolution on the part of people naturally. This is, an, this is an industrial movement that is caused by certain, I would argue, spirits on this earth. General population, it's just bad people out there that don't have the best interests of, of humanity in mind. Other parts are changing more from inventions occurring outside. Such was largely the case with the family in Europe and the United States in the 19th century. These unequal rates of change, and we, we see what happened because of the Industrial Revolution he's referring to. These unequal rates of change in the different correlated parts of the culture causes stress and strains in the relationship of parts of the culture. There thus occurs in a changing society maladjustment between its parts, adjustments which are either less satisfactory than either previous or possible future relationships. As an illustration, the relationship that exists between science and religion has been disturbed at various times by virtue of discoveries in science relating to the nature of the world and of man. Very key. These acute tensions become eventually smoothed out, but for the time, there is a serious maladjustment, usually for the part of culture which receives the force of invention. We are now receiving the force of invention. Okay. AI, 
uh, interconnected cyber physical systems, biodigital convergence. These are all versions of this that we're experiencing right now. Uh, force of invention, right? Social or mechanical. And we're experiencing uh, forced social inventions, right? Ways to operate each other, say, about health, right? Uh, uh, ways to go about our relationships through devices, right? As well as mechanical, operating digitally for the most part, operating through network systems, etc. Uh, these strains are in many cases caused by the fact that there is a delay or lag in keeping up with the pre precipitating changes. In modern society, mechanical invention and scientific discovery are, in fact, the precipitators of many changes in, the, in other parts of culture. The various social organizations, philosophies, and habits are forced to adjust after a delay to new situations brought about by these mechanical and scientific innovations. Uh, these adjustments do not take place instantaneously, but are made after a delay and are called cultural lags. Over the long course of social evolution, measured in thousands of years, cultural lags are invisible. This is key, right? Over the long course of social evolution, measured in thousands of years, cultural lags are invisible. At any particular moment, however, they may be numerous and acute. Right now, we are, discover we are experiencing a very acute moment in this, in this lag and in this change, this forced invention on us all. And it's being sold to us under the guise of entertainment, right? Uh, 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 convenience, uh, help, assistance, etc. A society long stationary without any social changes is in an equ equilibrium. The various parts, through trial and error, and error, have become adjusted to one another. There is a harmonious relationship of the various culture traits. There is no social evolution. But when a significant invention occurs in one part of culture, the balance is disturbed. Change is set up in the other related parts as a process of adjustment to the new invention. The social evolution goes forward by inventions which produce a, dis a disequilibrium in society, which in turn sets up forces which seek a new equilibrium. This, this sentence here is, is, is a perfect description of what we're dealing with right now. Let me repeat this. The social evolution goes forward by inventions which produce a disequilibrium. As these inventions push us forward into the digital realm of metaverse, virtual reality, simulation theory, a biodigital convergence, we're forced socially to adapt. We are forced socially to move forward, forward with this. What is it doing? It's creating the relating crisis. It's creating the maladjustment, mental illnesses, the, the, the identity issues, the family issues. We see what's happening in Japan, which in my view has a lot to do with the technology aside from other economic and, and, and let's say cultural issues over time. But this new influx of technology at the expense of real human relating, real human connection, is, is forcing us to adapt to it. We're not adapting well, are we? There is a disequilibrium at the moment. Solutions are being offered up, right? A high assistance, prawn, only fans. Oh, you can't get a job, sell your butt on the internet. Which in turn sets up forces which seek a new equilibrium. The new equilibrium is biodigital convergence. Post-humanism by way of transhumanism. Singularity. That's where we're at. That's exactly where we're at. The whole point is that it's only science fiction until it's reality. Yes, sir.